your molecular bio, introduction to mole bio and biomolecules. So here are the learning objectives. So at the end of the unit, the student should be able to study the development of molecular biology and the scientists, including their contribution. Relate cell biology, genetics, and biochem to mole bio and compare and contrast the composition, function, and structure of the different biological molecule and learn the importance of the different biomolecules in the cell and to the organism as a whole. Class, kailan kayo nag-biochem? Anong year? Second year ba? Second sem or second year first sem? When was your biochemistry subject? Second year first sem. Okay. So let's start with evolution and cell theory class. So in based on the cell theory class, ang cell nyo is considered as the basic structural and functional unit of all living organisms. Now, let's have a review. Try to answer. If there are a group of cells na nagsama-sama, what would the be produced class? If tissue. There are, okay, tissues. Very good. And if a group of tissues combine, there would be what? Organ. And then from if there are a group of organs, you would produce? Organ system. Organ system. Organ system. system. Body system. Very good. Body now, system. Now, the cell is considered as the basic structural and functional unit of all living organism class. So, kung walang cell, walang tissue. Kung walang tissue, walang organ. Kung walang organ, walang body system. Kung walang body system, patay ang tao. Now, the cell is considered as the smallest unit of light and can replicate independently. When you say replicate independently, hindi niya kailangan, it does not require other substances or other catalysts. Kaya niyang mag-reproduce class on its own to form many cells. Now, the study of cell is what you call cell biology. Now, cells would vary from individual single cell organism. An example of this is your bacteria to even multicellular structures such as your tissue, your organs, and even organisms such as your animals and plants. So ang cells nyo class are basically can be unicellular. Unicellular, uni meaning single, yung mga single cell, or they could be multicellular. Kapag sinabi nyo unicellular, mag-isa lang siya lagi. And an, an example of this is your bacteria. Well, your multicellular naman class, yun yung sinasabi ko nagkukumpul-kumpul sila, nagkukumbine to form tissues, organs. And they are considered as the foundation of animals and plants. Now, your cell was discovered by Robert Hooke in 1665. With the discovery of the cell, it was made possible through the invention of the microscope. He first observed cell in thin slices of bottle cork. Alam niyo yung bottle cork class? Saan niyo nakikita tong bottle cork na to? Sa so wine. Yeah, sa so wine, di ba? So, binuksan niyo yung wine class. Then he made thin slices of the cork. Then from there, nakita niya using the microscope ang, ang tsura ng mga cells. Now, Hooke discovered many tiny pores that he named cells. This came from the Latin word cella, and he described the cell as tiny boxes or a honeycomb. He thought that cells existed in plants and in fungi. So, pagkakita niya dun sa, sa court, Ang itsura class mo ang mga boxes, tiny boxes, or even in a honeycomb position. And akala niya nung time na yun, he thought that the cells would only exist in plants and fungi. Yun pala, it could also, it could, it could also survive on its own even in bacteria. Now, let's continue. So this was Robert Hooke's microscope. Nung nag-aaral ako sa CEO class, ewan ko kung na-encounter nyo to. Hopefully naman ngayong ano, face-to-face, -face, hindi nyo ma-encounter. We had that simple microscope. Yung simple microscope na yun, kailangan namin humanap ng light source kasi walang saksakan. It was a non-electrical microscope. So noong time na yun, pupunta pa kami sa bintana, pupuesto pa kami sa bintana para lang makakita ng light source. And ang iba pa sa aming ginagawa namin, um, we would use our cellphone 
yung cellphone na luma yung mga 3210, 3310, ganyan, mga ganong mga ganong phone. And we would use the flashlight. So, na dung time ni Robert took, I think based on the picture, nakikita niyo may apoy. So that would be the source of the light source. Yun yung source ng light niya. And then, it would be focused towards the lens. Dun, dun niya sisilipin yung ano. And then, this was the drawing of the structure of court by Robert Hook that appeared in the book Micrographia. So if you notice, para siyang boxes, as mentioned in the previous slide. Tapos mukha pa siyang honeycomb. So that's the first earlier, earliest description of cells by Robert Hook. Then another prominent scientist class, si Anton van Leeuwenhoek, in 1673, used a handmade microscope to observe pond scum and discovered single-cell organisms he called animal cubes. Now when you say pond scum class, yan yung nakakita na kayo ng pond, di ba? May mga green-green doon. Yun, he used that and he was able to observe this unicellular or single-celled organism, which he named animalcules. He also observed blood cells from fish, birds, frogs, dogs, and even humans. Now, between Hook and Lewin Hook discoveries and the mid-19th century, very little advancements in cell were made. So, silang dalawa lang class talaga yung may pinaka-discovery about the cells. Si Robert Hook saka si Anton van Lewin Hook. Now, this is prob probably due to the widely accepted traditional belief in spontaneous generation. Example would be mice from dirty clothes or corn husks and maggots from rotting meat. Now, when you say spontaneous generation, class, sabi nila, dati kasi, naniniwala sila na ang mga daga, ang mga maggots, they automatically, they are automatically created. If you have dirty clothes, if you have corn husks, automatically daw na nag-generate yung mga daga. If you have rotting meat, automatically rin daw na kusang nagkakaroon ng maggots. But that was a traditional belief class. At alam naman natin na hindi ganun yun na porket may dirty clothes, bigla na lang magkakaroon ng daga. Or kung may corn husks, bigla-bigla na rin magkakaroon ng mice. Or if there's a rotting meat, magkakaroon ng mag maggots. Siyempre, kailangan muna ng fly. And the fly would, in, would um, insert or inoculate the meat with the eggs. And yung eggs would become maggots. So, ganun yung ano. Now, in 19th century, many doubted spontaneous generation. And this was disproved by Louis Pasteur. So, si Louis Pasteur class ang nag-disprove dito sa belief na to, itong spontaneous generation. Now, let's continue. In 1838, German botanist Matthias Schilden concluded that all plant parts are made of cell. In 1839, German physiologist Theodor Schwann, who was a close, close friend of Schleiden, stated that all animal tissues are composed of cell. And in 1858, Rudolf Virchow, a German physician, after extensive study of cellular pathology, concluded that cells must arise from pre-existing cells. So ang cells daw class, they would only arise from pre-existing cell. So kailangan merong cell muna before another cell could be produced. In basic class, ang cell theory would state that all organisms are composed of one or more cell. Cell is the basic unit of life in all living things. And all cells are produced by the division of pre-existing cells. Now, there's what you call a modern cell theory. Now, it would contain four statements. The first one would be, the cell would contain hereditary information known as your DNA, which is passed on from the, from the cell, from cell to cell during cellular division. Then the second one would be all cells are basically the same in chemical composition and metabolic activity. And the third one is that all basic chemical and physiological functions are carried out inside the cell, such as your movement, digestion, etc. Then cell activity would depend on the activities of subcellular structure 
within the cell, such as your organelles, your nucleus, your plasma membrane, etc. Now, do you still remember class yung mga different organelles ng ano nyo, ng cell? Sige, let's try to have a review. State nyo sa akin yung function niya. This one. Powerhouse of the cell. So the powerhouse. ATP. Yes, in some, in some cells, it's ATP. How about this one? Protein work benches. Protein synthesis. And then, ano pa ba? The, the Golgai apparatus. Transport and packaging. How about the plasma membrane? Semi-permeable. Semi-permeable what? Membrane. Semi-permeable. Sige, kaya mo yan. Semi-permeable. Outer layer or protective layer? Ah, protective layer. Okay. Semi-permeable, protective layer. Ano pa ba? Uh, so that's... PR. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum, yes. Anong function ng endoplasmic reticulum? Production and transport. Hindi na ka naalala ko dito, in transport. Pag-ride, uh, pag-rough po, mm. ribosome sa touch, tapos smooth, wala po. Nice. Pero for liquid production. Mm. Okay, let's continue. Now, the uses of cell theory class. Now, nowadays, ang cell theory is usually used for disease, health, medical research, research, and even for treatment in curing AIDS, cancer, vaccine, cloning, stem cell research, etc. Now, it's very amazing to think that the cells that make up our bodies are just as alive as we are. Humans are just as designed community of cells which must work together to survive. The average human class, human being is composed of around 100 trillion individual cells. So nowadays class, if it weren't for the cell studies, yung mga studies about cells, we wouldn't be able to treat the different diseases. Kasi one of the problems, if, if you've read in some books, I ko kung may subject kayo na physiology or pathophysiology. Um, if you notice sa pathophy na, na subject kung meron man, uh, it's always, the disease would always start with the most single cells. It's simula siya from the cells and there would be a mutation. And from the mutation, it would affect the entire organ and in some cases, the entire organ system, specifically in cancer. Now, there are two known types of cell class. We have your prokaryotic, and eukaryotic cells. Now, to differentiate this, the thing you need to remember is that your eukaryotic cells would contain a nucleus, while your prokaryotic does not have a nucleus. Another thing you need to remember is that prokaryotes are single-celled organisms, while eukaryotes can either be single-celled or multi-celled. So here's a question. Ang bacteria class, is it a prokaryote? Or a eukaryote. Ang virus ba? Can you consider a virus a cell? Wala nyo. What do you think? Prokaryote din po siya, sir. Prokaryote. Not made out of cells at all po. No, actually viruses class are not considered as a cell. Wala ka siyang mga organelles, wala siyang ano. It is just made up of uh, DNA and RNA. Hindi siya considered as cell. So it's not considered a prokaryote or a eukaryote. Now, prokaryotic cell or pro, this comes from the word pro and cardio. Pro meaning first form. Ito yung prefix niya, pro, meaning first form. And the word cardio, nucleus. Now, prokaryote is a single-celled organism or single-celled cell that lacks a membrane-bound nucleus. 
mitochondria, or any other organelle in the cytoplasm except ribosome. Now, cell division would occur mainly by binary fission. Now, when you say fission class, fission is the opposite of fusion. Diba? Pag sinabi mong fusion, magko-combine. Now, from the opposite, or the antonym, yung fission would be to separate. Kaya ang bacteria nyo nga class, whenever they multiply, from a single bacteria, it would become two. From, a, from two, it would become four, etc., etc. Kaya sobrang bilis nila dumami. Now, prokaryotic cells were the first form of life on Earth, and they are simpler and smaller than eukaryotic cells. So here's an example of your bacteria class or your prokaryotic cell. It has a cytoplasm, a flagellum, ribosome, a nucleoid containing the DNA, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, the capsule, the plasmid, and the pili. Tapos na ba kayo class sa bakte? Hindi pa. First, May name pa lang po, sir. Okay. So, just to give you an idea, ang flagellum nyo, does anyone know what's the purpose of the flagellum? For movement, for motility. Um, how about the plasmid? Para saan ang plasmid class? Do have any, does anyone know? Okay, yung plasmid nyo class, they would contain the antibiotic. They would contain the antibiotic resistant gene. Yan, yan ang purpose nila. Kaya nga, meron mga klase, pero kaya meron tayong tinatawag class ng mga drug resistant bacteria. The reason for that is because bacteria would contain the plasmid. So this is an example of your prokaryotic cell bacteria. Now let's go to your eukaryotic. So you the prefix U meaning true, and karyo meaning nucleus. Now, eukaryotes have specialized organelles in the cytoplasm, a membrane-bound nucleus enclosing genetic material organized into chromosome. Their cell division would occur by mitosis and meiosis. Plants, animals, fungi, protozoa, and algae are examples of eukaryotic cells. Now, these cells are larger than a typical prokaryote and can be as much as a thousand times greater in volume. Now, if you notice, meron siyang chloroplast, meron siyang nucleolus, meron siyang rough ER, Golgi apparatus, smooth ER, nuclear pore, a nucleus, and a mitochondria. So they are larger and more, um, more greater in volume when you compare it with your prokaryotes. So, ang, ang mode of replication nila, if you still recall, ang prokaryotes nyo, an example would be bacteria to divide by binary fission. Kapag ang eukaryotes, they would divide two ways, mitosis and meiosis. So, here's a better differentiating table nila, class. So prokaryotes, example would be bacteria, eukaryotes, example would be algae, fungi, protozoa, and animals. Size of prokaryote would be 1, one to 2 by one, 1 to 4 micrometer or less. Eukaryotes are greater than 5 micrometer in width or diameter. Then the genetic system location would be the nucleoid, chromatin body, or nuclear material. While for the eukaryotic cell would be the nucleus, the mitochondria, and even chloroplasts. For the structure of the nucleus, your prokaryotic cells are not bound by a nuclear membrane, and they would have a one circular chromosome. Then in some cases, chromosomes does not contain histones, so there would be no mitotic division, and nucleolus is absent. Ang nucleolus class, ito yung nakikita sa loob ng nucleus nyo. For the eukaryotic, it is bounded by the nuclear membrane, would have more than one chromosome. Chromosomes have histone, mitotic nuclear division would occur, and nucleolus is present. So this is the uh, difference between your prokaryotic and your eukaryotic cells. 
cytoplasmic structure, we have your mitochondria absent, chloroplast absent, Golgi bodies absent, ER absent, and membrane-bound vacuoles absent in your prokaryotic cells. But in your prokaryotic cells, there's what we call your 70S ribosome. This is a sub, it has a subunit 50S and 30S. It did discuss natin yan class in the coming lectures. And then yung eukaryotic cell nyo naman would contain mitochondria, chloroplast, Golgi body, ER, membrane-bound vacuoles. It has an 80S ribosome and as a subunit 60S and 40S. Cell wall would contain, excuse me, peptidoglycan, but your eukaryotic would have the absence of peptidoglycan. Now, ang peptidoglycan class, ang peptidoglycan sa bacteriology, one of the purpose nito is that it is the one responsible for the gram stain reaction. If narinig nyo na yung gram stain class sa bacteria or you have some idea about it, um, meron tayong dalawang klase ng bacteria based on gram stain reaction. We have your gram positive and your gram negative. Now, if you're gram positive, if the bacteria is gram positive, they would have a very thick peptido glycan. Pero kapag gram negative siya class, the peptidoglycan is thin or in some cases absent. So yun ang purpose ng peptidoglycan sa bacteria. It is responsible for the gram stain reaction. Kapag gram positive, it has a very thick peptidoglycan. Kapag gram negative, it's either thin or absent. And we have your pseudopods Absent siya for prokaryote and present in some eukaryotic cell, katulad ng algae nyo. Okay, now let's go to your classical biochemistry and genetics. Now, biochemistry class is the study of chemical substances and processes that would occur in living organisms like plants, animals, and microorganisms. It would usually deal with the chemistry of light. And as such, it would draw on the techniques of analytical, organic, and physical chemistry, including physiology that involve in life vital processes and function. It is not surprising, therefore, that biochem enters into the investigation of chemical changes and diseases, drug action, nutrition, immunity, agriculture, and genetics. Now, to simplify this class, ang biochem nyo kasi is one of the founding sciences for mol bio without biochemistry class hindi madedevelop ang molecular biology because as stated here it deals with the chemistry of light and as such it would involve different analytical organic and physical chemistry specifically ang mga vital processes ng light now, on the other hand, genetics as a course is an important component in understanding molecular bio. Genetics is a branch of biology concerned with the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in, or in organisms. Now, one of the scientists na kilala sa genetics is yung pare, yung friar, Augustinian friar, na si Gregor Bendel. He was working in the 19th century and was the first to study genetics scientifically. Mendel studied trait inheritance patterns in the way traits are handed down from parents to offspring. He observed that organisms such as your pea plants inherit traits by way of discrete units of inheritance. So, may explain kyan class. This term still used today is a somewhat ambiguous definition to what of what is referred to as a gene. Trait inheritance and molecular inheritance mechanisms of gene are still primary principles of genetic in the 21st century. But modern genetics has expanded beyond inheritance to studying the function and behavior of genes. Now, genetics has given rise to a number of subfields, including molecular genetics, epigenetics, and population genetics. Now, you have to understand, class, whenever you would encounter the word gene, this would refer to the inherited, inherited traits. 
So si Mendel, he was able to demonstrate this using tea plants. So ito yung experiment niya. Explain ko. Ang ginawa niya, class, he took, kumuha siya ng dalawang types of tea plant. One tall tea plant and one small or dwarf tea plant. Now, si tall tea plant class, let's call this the letter T. Si dwarf tea, dwarf tea plant, let's call it the small letter T. Now, when he cross, uh, cross these two plants, it produce a tall, a tall tea plant known as big T, small T. Itong F1 dito, this is the first generation of mixed tea plant. Ulitin ko class. Si Mendel, ang ginawa niya, he took two types of tea plant, a tall tea plant and a dwarf tea plant. Let's call the tall tea plant big letter T and the dwarf or the small tea plant small letter T. Now, when he mix or cross these two plants, it produce a tall pea plant, and we will call that big T and small T pea plant. Nag mix sila, nag combine sila, and this is now considered the first generation of mixed pea plant. Ang next naman ginawa niya class, he cross some of the first generation plants among themselves. Of this offsprings, the F two. F2 naman would stand for the second generation of tea plants. About this, three-fourth of the plants were tall and one-fourth were dwarf. Now, think, anito na last. Um, this is the first generation. So this is known as your big T, small T, big T, small t. Now, if you're going to follow what we call a Punnett square, this is known as a Punnett square. I think most of you have encountered this. So you, you add the trait or the gene, yung big T, small t of the first plant, and the second plant, big T, small t. And if you cross them, you would have big T, big T, small t, big T, small t again, and two small t's. Now, the big t here class to explain is known as the dominant, the dominant gene. While the small t here would, re would refer to the recessive gene. Now, ano ba tong dominant recessive gene na to, sir? The dominant gene class would manifest would manifest itself even if it's all by itself or alone siya. Kapag naman recessive class, it needs two, um, two genes for it to manifest. So in this case, sa Mendel experiment niya, Yung tall pea plants are the dominant trait and the dwarf one would be the recessive. Now, naalala nyo yung Punnett square kanina. This is considered dominant kasi parehong, parehong dominant gene, big T. The second one is also considered dominant. Bakit? Kasi remember, it only needs one one gene for it to manifest, which is the big T. So this is again considered dominant. And the third one is also considered dominant because again, it only has, it only has, it even has one dominant gene, which is, which is the big T. And the small T is the one that would be recessive. Kaya ang nangyari sa experiment niya class, three-fourths of the plants were tall. So tatlo, if you notice sa Punnett square, tatlo yung dominant and one-fourth were dwarf. Ulitin ko <laughs> para magets nyo. Balik ako dito. Tagdag natin yung mga 
na ano kung sinabi. So ang ginawa ni Mendel class, he made an experiment using a tall and a dwarf pea plant. Now the tall pea plant here would be called the big T. This is the dominant the dominant tree. Well, the recessive one or the, the dwarf one would be known as the small T. This is the recessive, the recessive tree. Now, when he mixed the, the dominant trait and the recessive trait, it would produce a big T and a small T, and it would manifest as a tall. Bakit? Remember, ang sinabi ko kanina about dominant, it would only need a single gene for it to manifest. Dahil may big T siya, kahit mag-isa lang siya, siya pa rin, yung dominant trait pa rin yung magmamanifest. In this case, yung trait na yun is the tall one. And this would be known as the first generation of e-plots. Now next, ang ginawa ni Mendel class, krenos niya naman ulit tong first generation plant. So we have your big T, small T, then another first generation plant, big T, small T. Now, if you perform the Punnett square, big T, small T, big T, small T. You would get two big T, a big T and a small T. A big T and a small T again. So combine nyo lang siya class ganun. And then two small T's. Now remember the rule, if it's dominant, kahit isang dominant trait lang, kaya niyang mag-manifest. Uh, so this would be the dominant. So one plant would be tall. Dominant ulit. So another one plant would be tall again. And this one also would be dominant as well. So one plant would be tall. But on the last one, the two small T's, walang dominant gene class. Therefore, ang magmamanifest na trait would be the recessive trait. And as mentioned earlier, ang recessive trait nyo is yung small T. Therefore, three parts of the plant were tall, tatlo ang tall, and one fourth were dwarf. And this would be considered, this would now be considered class as your second generation. Sige, tingnan natin kung nag-gets nyo. Um, let's say I want to crossbreed class the second generation. Ipiliin ko yung tall and ipiliin ko yung dwarf. Now tell me ano yung trait nitong tall or yung gene nitong tall. Itong second generation na to. What's the gene? Dominant. Ha? Huh? Dominant. Oh, what's the, what's the, oh. no? What's the dominant gene? Big T. Big T and? Small T. Small T. What about the dwarf? Dalawang small T. Dalawang small T. Now, if you're going to apply this in Punnett Square, What's the gene for this one? Big T, small T. This one? Big T, small T. This one? Dalawang small T. This one? Dalawang small T. Therefore, ilan ang tall plants mo? Dalawa pa yun. Dalawa pa yung tall plants. Then, dalawa din pa yung small dwarf. Alright, very good. Nag-gets nyo ba class kung paano yung experiment niya? Yes, Paul. How about the rest, si Matthew? How yes, about yes, the rest? Yes, yes, please. Nag-gets nyo naman. Na, nalito ba? Gusto nyo ulitin ko? Gets okay. na. Oh, Oo, sir. Diba? Yun yung experiment niya. This is also applicable class to blood type. Um, 
Miss ano, Miss Body, Angela. Anong blood type mo? Miss Body, Angela. What's the blood type of your parents? Makamal makamalay mo ampon ka pala, Charles. Joke lang. <laughs> so ano, anong blood type ng parents mo? Hindi mo sure. <laughs> Sino dito alam ang blood type ng parents niya, class? Saka blood type niya. Uh, sige, Miss Corpus, anong blood type mo? O plus po, sir. What's the blood type of your parents? Um, B positive po si daddy, tas O positive po si mommy. Okay. Ang blood type class, yung nakikita natin, is what we call a phenotype. In this case, ang phenotype dito would be the tall and the dwarf. Then we have another term known as your genotype. Ano yung genotype? Yung genotype class, yung genes, yung TT, big T, small T. Now sa blood typing class, baka nagtataka kayo, bakit O positive sir si Miss Corpus eh, may B positive siya? It's like this class. Ang phenotype sa blood typing is would be, ano yung four blood types natin class? Saka O. Now, if you put this into their genotype, it could either be A, AB, AO, AA, BO, BB, and OO. Ganyan ang genotype niya. Now, if the blood type of his corpus is blood type A, tapos ang father and mother niya would be, ganito yung mga possible na genetic or genes ng parents niya. The father could be BO, and the mother would be OO. So from this class, yung B, ito yung dominant ha? From here, this would be BO, OO, BO, OO. Therefore, there is a 50% chance for her to become blood type B and a 50% chance to become blood type O. Ganun yun. Kaya minsan kasi may nagtanong sa akin, Sir, ang, ang blood type ko, blood type A. Ang parents ko, parehong blood type O. Is this possible, class? Based on what I've just taught you. Posible ba to? Yes or no? Ang blood type ng bata, A positive. Ang blood type ng parents, O. Pareho. Is it possible? Yes or no? Hindi po, sir. Kasi. <laughs> Tinan nyo ah, i-apply natin sa panet. If ang both parents niya is blood type O, based on the genotype, O, O. What would be your interpretation? Not O. 100% dapat ang blood type niya. O. Meaning, ang child ay Ano? Blood type O. Yung bata na blood type A, ano meaning? Kung yung parents niya blood type o, Adopted. It's adopted or in worst case scenario, iba yung father niya. Alright? Questions, class? Na? Na po. Alright. Then, Mendel also tested six other traits of pea plants, class. He tested for the seed shape, wrinkled or smooth. He also tested for the seed color, yellow or green. In each case, all of the first generation plants look as though they had inherited the trait of just one of their two parents. But in their second generation, both traits would always appear and they would always be in a three is to one ratio. So the first generation class, Ang laging nagma-manifest is a single trait, meaning yung dominant trait lang. Pero dun sa second generation, na-dilute siya further, 
And nagkaroon na ng 3 is to 1 ratio wherein 3 would manifest the dominant trait and 1 would show the recessive trait. Now the trait which was expressed in the first generation was always about 3 times as numerous in the second generation as was the other one which was hidden in the first generation. Now, homozygous class and heterozygous. So, yung kaninang nire-refer ko na double T, that would be your homozygous. And your heterozygous naman would be different. Now, you would call this as homozygous homozygous dominant. You would call this as heterozygous dominant. May tanong ako, class. Meron ba tayong homozygous recessive? Ay, heterozygous recessive. Yes or no? Is it possible to have a heterozygous recessive gene? Pag sinabi mong heterozygous recessive, paano, Ms. Corpus? Homozygous lang po ata. Homozygous lang siya. Kasi, big T. Small T lang. Pareho. Kapag ginawa mo kasi ang heterozygous recessive, Pag ginawa mo siyang heterozygous recessive, ganyan siya itsura niya. So, this is not heterozygous recessive anymore. This is heterozygous dominant. So, there, are, there is a homozygous dominant, there is a heterozygous dominant, but there is only homozygous recessive. Now, when both alleles for a trait are identical, say that the organism is homozygous for the trait, the two alleles are different. Class of. The big T would be the homozygous tall and the, sm the big T small T would be your heterozygous tall. Now tall is dominant over dwarf and dwarf is said to be a recessive trait and can only be expressed when there are two copies of it. So please remember that ha, kapag dominant ang trait, kahit isang copy lang ng gene would allow it to express itself. But kapag recessive siya, um, it would require two copies. Kung i-apply natin to sa tao class, um, let's say ganito. The father, the mother. Si father mo, positive for a certain, let's say, hemophilia. Hemophilia is a coagulation disorder sa dugo. Yung mother mo naman, negative for hemophilia. Now, yung child manifested hemophilia. Ano ngayon ang tawag mo sa hemophilia? Is it dominant or recessive disease? Is hemophilia a dominant or a recessive disease based on this example? Dominant po. Dominant because it only required a single copy, which is from the mother. Wait, la pasa. How about this one? Mother, father, both positive for the for the trait. It manifested. Uh, sorry, sorry, madam. The mother, father, mother is positive for the, for a certain disorder. Yung father niya naman negative. It did not manifest the disorder. Anong tawag mo ngayon dun sa sakit? Recessive. Recessive because it would require another copy for it to manifest. In a case na kailangan para yung both mother and father for it to manifest. So I hope you understand that class, yung do difference ng dominant at yung 
this is I will post this in YouTube the recording you can review it there yeah so this is your homozygous dominant this is uh, homozygous um, recessive and your heterozygous dominant now Mendel's original cross produce only tall offspring so ito yung example class ng no, Punnett square na inexplain ko In this case, lahat yan, puro tol ang i-manifest. Now, in the second generation, the rule of probability would dictate that only one-fourth of the plants would be recessive or dwarf, and three-fourths would have at least one, uh, one dominant and hence be tall. Then Mendel also studied many traits in pea plants, yung seed shape, smooth or wrinkled, seed color, green or yellow, pod shape, smooth or bumpy, pod color, green or yellow, flower location at the leaf or the tip of the branch. Now many traits are passed on by genes and the genes encode the information for protein and the genes are segments of the egg. Mendel found that two factors determine trait. These are alternate, alternate forms of gene one from each parent. These are now called alleles. So alleles class are the alternate forms of gene, one from each parent. This is known as your alleles. So classical genetics is that Mendel basically made the basic laws of inheritance. They had a classic pea plant experiment, a pure breed and a hybrid. The result would be the first and second generation, and there was the discovery of the dominant and the recessive genes. Yeah. So ending ng experiment na class, he was able to produce 787 tall and 277 dwarf peat plants. Uh, I'll skip this one. Here's another rule of classical genetics. So traits are passed from a parent to, to the offspring. The mechanism is unknown. Two genes for each trait, one from each parent, and there are dominant and recessive genes. And the one that is always expressed is your dominant gene. Now alleles are two different forms of the gene. For many hereditary traits, genes would exist in two or more different forms called allele. On each pair of chromosome, there is one allele for a particular gene on each. Example would be your A, B, O blood groups. In humans, there are three alleles, the A, the B, and the O. Ito yung sinasabi ko kanina class na genotype. In genotype would be the genetic makeup of the, of the blood type or the allele. Yung A, O, B, O, A, B, and O, O. The phenotype naman class, this is the one that is being manifested. Yung nakikita natin, yung nadetetect natin. In this case, yun yung blood type A, B, A, B, and O. An example would be if you have blood type A, 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 O, you would have type A. B, 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 O, type B. Type O could be O, O, and A, B is type A, B. So please remember, class, ah, ang genotype ng blood type A, this is the genotype, are AA and AO. The genotype of type B is BB and BO. Genotype is the genetic composition, and phenotype is the being manifested physical characteristics. ABO blood groups, A and B are codominant, and O is recessive. Kaya nga class, pag um, ang blood type ng parents mo is AO, yung genotype niya, ang laging dominant, ang laging magmamanifest would be A or B. Because O is always recessive. Then qualitative, there was the observational and quantitative, this are predictive model used to trace genetic disease. 
So that ends the genetics. May question ba kayo sa part na to, class? I hope you were able to understand the difference between dominant, recessive, yung Punnett square. May gets naman? Yes po. Yes po. Anong mga subject niyo pala, class, ngayong, ano, ngayong block one? Aside from all that. Clinical chemistry. Sino clinical death. chem niyo, Mr. Matthew? Sir Pato. Okay. Ano pa? Bacteriology po. Sino prop? Select po si Sir Cruz sa lab si Ms. Escobar. Kamusta si Sir Cruz? Okay naman? Takot ka? Hindi naman? Opo, okay naman. <laughs> Wait naman yun si Sir Cruz. Don't worry. Uh, hopefully, kapag face-to-face -face kayo sa kanya. Sino laboratory niyo sa Molbayo pala? Si Sir Pata din. Okay, let's continue with the merging of biochem and genetics. Now, researchers in biochem would use specific techniques, native or from originally from biochem, but increasingly they would combine these techniques and ideas would develop in the field of genetics, mol bio and biophysics. There is not a defined line between these disciplines. Now, biochem is the study of the chemical substances and vital processes occurring in living organisms. Now, biochem is focused heavily on the role, function, and structure of biomolecules. Now, merong tinanong sa akin, class, yung mga magbo-board exam. One of the questions they ask, Sir, possible ba na ang molecular biology be a board exam subject? Ano sa tingin nyo, class? Posible ba? Yes or no? Tingin nyo ba it's possible na isama ng board exam, uh, board ng mga examiner ang molecular bio as a subject sa board exam natin. Ano sa tingin nyo? Yes po, sir. Um, kasi sir, important um, branch din po ito ng Okay. How about the rest? Ano sa tingin nyo? Opinion nyo lang, class. Just share your opinion. Wala namang maling sagot dyan sa tanong na yun. Uh, yes din po sir, kasi yes, po. cover niya yung, ano po, yung molecular bio, connected po siya din sa biochemistry and genetics po. Hmm. How about the rest? <laughs> Tatawag nga ako. Shy naman ang mga student ko dito. Sinis ano... Si Miss Arisa Saris. Miss Arisa, dyan ka ba? Si Justin Troy. Justin, are you there? Lan, nag-lead na. Last, huwag niyo naman sayangin yung tuition niyo. Attend naman kaya. Miss Tabilin, what do you think? Miss Mary Ann. Hello po, sir. Hello. Hello. Is it possible na pwedeng masama to sa board exam? Possible po, sir, kasi interconnected po nga din po siya with biochem po. Hmm. Actually, tama naman yung sagot niyo, class. Possible talaga. Pero alam niyo, pag ginawa yan ng, ano, ng examiner, ang unang magagalit sa atin, or ang unang magpipetition niyan would be the biologists. Kasi sa kanila talaga tong field na to. Pero kasi since nowadays, ang molecular kasi, ang molecular techniques is based on molecular biology. Pero yun nga lang, magagalit ang mga biology. Same way na nagalit tayong mga medtech. Medtechs get mad at nurses na nagpe-perform ng phlebotomy. Kasi para sa ating mga medtech, ang phlebotomy lang is para sa ating medtech lang. Mayroon pang ang case class sa US na gusto ng isang ng association ng nurses ba na parang pati nurses daw mag-handle ng machine sa laboratory. So nung ano yun, nag-petition sila, nagalit sila, yun na nga lang yung ano ng medtech, pakikailaman pa ng nurses. Anyways, continue natin. Now, genetics would be the study of the effect of genetic differences in organism. This can often be inferred by the absence of a normal component, such as your one gene. The study of mutants 
organisms that lack one or more functional component with respect to the so-called wild type or normal phenotype. Then you have your molecular biology, which is the study of molecular underpinnings of the processes of replication, transcription, translation, and cell function. Then we have the central dogma of molecular bio, where genetic material is transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein, despite being oversimplified, would still provide a good starting point for understanding the field. Now, ang molecular bio kasi class, ang pinaka-starting niyan is what we call the central dogma, which we would discuss mamaya on. Now, the history of mole bio would be like this. So, si merong tayong tinatawag na scientist, si Frederick Mischer. In 1869, he extracted a viscous white substance from the nucleus of a cell. The substance was slightly acidic and rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. He named it nuclein because it was found in the nucleus of the cell. So, please remember this class, yung na-isolate yung na niya, was rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. And ang, ang first name nito was nuclein because it was found in the nucleus. Now, Gregor Mandel again, by studying pea, pea plants, he determined that characteristics are inherited in discrete units known as genes. Now, inherited units are independently segregated and assorted. Inherited units can be dominant or recessive, as we discussed earlier. Then there's another scientist, si Thomas Hunt. In early 1900s, he worked at the Columbia University and later at California Technology or your Caltech. Now he studied fruit fly eye color, determining the trait was sex link. Won the Nobel Prize in 19, 1933 for his work on chromosomes and genetics. So ito si Thomas Hunt Morgan class. He experimented on the fruit fly. That fruit flies were uh, transmitted. Yung gene nila was sex-linked transmitted. So you have your white-eyed mutant fly and your red-eyed wild-type fly. And by this point, it was known that genetic material was located on a chromosome. Just this genetic material was in discrete units called gene. It was not known whether the gene was simply a protein or whether it was composed of DNA. And then in the late 1928, si Frederick Griffith worked with a bacteria called your Streptococcus pneumoniae. He tried to develop against pneumonia and defined the term transformation. So si Frederick Griffith class nag experiment sa sa bacteria. This is a gram positive coxide, known as your S pneumonia. Now, due to this experiment class, nagkaroon tayo ng tinatawag na transformation. Now, ano ba tong transformation na to? Now, this is the transformation principle. So, he had two strains class. We have your S strain. This is the strain of the bacteria, ha? S strain and the R strain. Now, the S strain class is considered as a virulent strain, meaning deadly or nakakamatay. While the R strain is considered as the non-virulent strain. Now, what he did was he took um, dead bacterial cells that are S strain and R strain and they placed it on a rat. So, unang ginawa niya, he put living S strain and the mouse would die then the living S strains would be found in the heart. Next naman, naglagay siya ng R strain or the non-virulent strain and the, and the mouse was healthy. No bacterial cells were found in the heart. Ulitin ko, he used the S strain or the virulent strain, nilagay niya sa rat or sa daga or sa mouse, and the mouse would die and he was able to find S strain cells in the heart. When he used naman the R strain or the non-virulent strain, there was no changes to the mouse and no bacterial cells were found in the heart. Ang ginawa na naman niyang experiment, he killed the virulent S strain by heating it. After killing it, after heating it class, 
inintroduce niya ngayon sa isang healthy mouse. Sa isang mouse. Nung nai-introduce niya sa mouse, yung killed, killed by heating na strain cause no bacterial cells to be found in the heart. Healthy pa rin yung daga. So, ito yung first experiment niya. Ito yung second. And the third experiment naman, he mixed dead S-strain cells with living non-virulent R-strain. What happens here is that the mouse died and living S-strain cells were found in the heart. Kaya dito nangyayari yung transformation plus nag-transform yung R strain na non-virulent into, into an S strain virulent bacteria. Nung inintroduce niya yung dead S strain na cell. So just to, to make it clear, ulitin ko, sa first experiment niya, yung S-strain, inintroduce niya sa mouse, namatay yung daga. Nakita yung S-strain sa heart. Ginawa niya ulit, kumuha siya ng R-strain, non-virulent, inintroduce niya sa daga, the, the mouse was still healthy. In the second experiment naman class, kumuha siya ng S-strain, ininit niya, he killed the S-strain by heating, and he introduced it to the healthy mouse. In his third experiment, he mixed the dead S-strain by heating with living non-virulent R-strain. This caused the mouse to die and living S-strain cells were found in the heart. This just means that the R-strain, itong living non-virulent R-strain bacteria, were transformed when they were mixed with the dead S-strain. And that's the principle of your transformation. In hypothesis, material and dead bacterial cells can genetically transform living bacterial cells. Questions on this class? May tanong? Wala po. Now, transformation is a change in a genotype and phenotype due to the incorporation of external DNA by a cell. Now, how did Griffith know that the dead mouse was killed by transformed bacteria? The dead mouse had living bacteria in its blood. So, dun yan nalaman class. Dun yan nalaman class on how um, the dead mouse was killed by transformed bacteria. Kasi di ba kanina sa final experiment niya, he used dead strain. Tapos, minix niya with the non-virulent or the R strain. Tapos in-inoculate niya to lahat sa daga or sa mouse. And the mouse would die and he was able to find living S strain bacteria ng subcocus ni Monmega. Yun naman. Then in 1944, Oswald Avery, an American biologist and physician, was born in Canada but grew up in New York City. He worked in the 1930s and 1950s and also worked with the transformation principle. His colleagues are McCarthy and McLeod. Avery's work involved in separating DNA and proteins and then attempting to see which substance could transform live non-pathogenic bacteria into pathogenic bacteria. So, and plus. So he makes different S strains. So S strain plus carbohydrate plus R strain, it would still be an R strain. Same with protein, R strain pa rin. Same with lipid, same with RNA. But the difference lang would be S strain plus DNA plus R strain. Ang nangyari, yung R-strain nyo would transform into S-strain. The reason for that is because of the presence of the DNA. Average conclusion is that DNA is the transforming substance. So yung DNA class ang nag-cause ng transformation ng 
non-virulent strain to virulent strain. However, most scientists at the time still believed that the transforming substance was a protein. Now, in Her Hershey and Chase in 1952, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase used phages. Ano ba tong phages na to? Phages are, used, are viruses used to infect bacteria. And they are also called T2 phages. Now, ito yung tinatawag natin class na bacteriophages. They would target bacteria. These are viruses made to target bacteria. Now, their question was, which part of the virus protein code or DNA is responsible for transforming E. coli? In 1952, they found the virus to infect a bacterial host by attaching it to the surface of the cell and in injecting its DNA into the cell. This produced 1,000 1, copies of new viruses which, which would burst out of the cell, resulting in cell death. So, the 1952 class na confirm na yung theory na DNA talaga ang nagkocause ng transformation ng non-virulent strain. So, ito si Hershey, Chase, Hershey and Chase. And this is your T2 fudge or your bacteria fudges. <coughs> Excuse me. So, they would attack the bacterial cell and then from their class, they would insert their DNA. Ito yung experiment nila. So they were going to mix radioactive labeled phages with bacteria. And the phages would infect the bacterial cell. They would agitate in a blender to separate phages outside the bacteria from the cell and their contents. Let's have a break. Two minutes. Inom lang ang tubig. So, continue ko class. So, they mix radioactively labeled phages with bacteria. The phages would infect the bacterial cell and agitate it in a blender to separate phages of salt the bacteria from the cell and their contents. And they're, they're, they were going to centrifuge the mixture so bacteria would form a pellet at the bottom of the test tube. Then measure the radioactivity in the pellet and the liquid. So, ang purpose nitong label na, label na to class was for them to identify if the, the DNA was successfully transmitted or na transformed doon sa bacteria. They would measure the radio, radioactivity in the pellet. And kapag sobrang taas ng radioactivity, it means that the transformation was successful. In conclusion, DNA is responsible for the transformation of bacteria, not proteins. Therefore, DNA class is the hereditary material. Now, another scientist, Erwin Shargaff, but this, is a, this was a biochemist that died in 2002. He worked at the Columbian University since 1950. 
published his study, The Proportion of Purines and Perimidine in DNA. Ang finding niya is what you call the Chargaff's rule. DNA composition would vary between different species. In a given species, the four nitrogen bases are present in a predictable ratio. So we have, ito yung four nitrogen bases class. We have your adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Now, based dito kasi sa Churgaff's rule na to class, itong four nitrogen bases na to, they have an equal proportion. So adenine would be 30.9%, thymine would be 29.4%, guanine would be 19.9%, and um, cytosine would be 19.8%. Now, itong mga nitrogen bases na to class have what you call a complementary pairing. Now, when you say complementary pairing, yun yung in, in simpler terms, meron silang fixed partner. In this case, ang partner ni adenine would be thymine, ang partner ng guanine would be cytosine. Now, Chargaff couldn't explain this, but this information later became crucial to Watson and Crick. Now, sino ba si Watson and Crick class? Later, we'll discuss that. Then we have your Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. They both work in London. Now, si Franklin and Wilkins class use X-ray crystallography to look at the shape of DNA. Their information gave Watson Creek the necessary information they needed to come up with the double helix structure. They were able to identify the width of the helix, the spacing of nitrogenous bases, and they also discovered that the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA lies on the outside of the molecule, not the inside, as was previously thought. So in DNA no class was found on the outside not inside and could not be discovered from her data was how the base paired on the inside of the helix for which james watson and francis crick had the answer so it was james watson class and francis crick they use wire models to conform with the measurements that franklin and wilkins have can have can come up come up with sila yung responsible class sa model ng dna which is a double helix. In 1950s, they put the latest, the last piece of DNA structure together from a variety of sources, including Franklin and Chargaff. They won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1962 for their discovery, and Maurice Wilkins was also included in winning the Nobel Prize. And Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl in 1958, discovered that DNA replication is semi-conservative. Now, when you say semi-conservative class, um, one half of the double helix is old and one half is new. So basically, ang semi-conservative, hindi full replacement ng DNA ang nangyayari. There would be still the old uh, DNA content and there would be new ones. So ito yung semi-conservative. Conservative talaga would be still using the old one and dispersive would be. Yeah. Now let's talk about the central dogma class. So the central dogma of molecular bio is an explanation of the flow of genetic information within a biological system. <coughs> Based on Francis Crick class, the central dogma of molecular bio deals with the detailed residue by residue transfer of sequential information. It states that such information cannot be transferred back from protein to either protein or nucleic acid. So, the central dogma class, to simplify this, would start with number one, replication. Replication wherein DNA would be replicated, you would replicate DNA. After that, there would be transcription. So transcription, you're going to convert DNA to RNA via the enzyme RNA polymerase. 
And the last step would be translation. Translation is the conversion of RNA into a protein. So that is the simplest explanation of your central dogma. Three steps, replication, wherein you would replicate the DNA. Transcription would be the conversion of DNA to RNA using the enzyme RNA polymerase. And the translation, which is the conversion of RNA to ribosome with the use of that RNA to protein with the use of ribosomes. I'll skip this. Skip the next class. Because we don't have any more time. The important thing is the central dogma. Now let's go to the biomolecules. So the biomolecules in your class would include First one would be carbohydrates class. So they will provide an energy source in the form of sugar for the cell energy storage, such as your starch and your glycogen. And they also may play a structural role such as your cellulose. The simplest subunit of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide. Now monosaccharide are simple sugars that are composed of three to seven carbon atoms. And the structure of the glucose molecule is a good representation of the carbohydrate subunit, also known as a mono. Then we have your examples of monosaccharide. We have your glucose, your fructose, your sucrose, maltose, starch, and even cellulose. The next one would be lipids. Now, they are naturally occurring hydropovic molecules. They are heterogeneous group of compounds related to fatty acid. They include fats, oils, waxes, and phospholipid. They make up 70% of the dry weight of the nervous system. And lipids are crucial for the healthy functioning of the nerve cells. Bakit class? Ang lipids nyo kasi, they are considered, uh, they are part of the covering of the myelin sheet. Yung myelin sheet nyo yun yung nagka-cover sa mga nerves, nerves natin. That's why 70% ng nervous system nyo are lipids. Now, lipids are greasy or oily organic substances. Lipids are sparingly soluble in water. So, hindi siya basta-basta na, 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 na didissolve sa tubig. And they are soluble only in organic solvent like chloroform, ether, and benzene. Lipids are composed of long hydrocarbon chain. Lipid molecules would hold a large amount of energy and an energy storage molecule. Lipids are generally esters of fatty acid and are building blocks of biological membrane. Now, most of the lipids would have a polar head and non-polar tail. Fatty acids can be unsaturated and saturated fatty acid. Lipids are present in biological membrane and are of three classes based on the type of hydrophilic head present. While your glycolipids naman class are lipids whose head would contain oligosaccharide with 1 to 15 saccharide residue. Phospholipids, however, would contain a positively charged head which are linked to the negatively charged phosphate group. Sterols whose head would contain a steroid ring. Now, the reason why class ang lipids nyo are insoluble in water or hindi siya nadidissolve is because it would have a hydrophilic head and in a hydrophobic tail. Now, let's say ito yung water class. They would be able to reach the surface, but due to the hydrophobic tail, the water would not be able to enter the lipid cell. That is why they are considered insoluble sa tubig. It is because of the presence of their nonpolar tail, which is hydrophobic. Now, this is the general characteristics. They are insoluble in water, soluble in solvents like ether, chloroform, methanol. They have high energy content and are metabolized to release calories. 
they would also act as insul electrical insulator. They insulate nerve axons. Yung sinasabi ko kanina, myelin sheet glass. They would contain saturated fatty acid. They are solid at room temp. Example would be animal fat. Now, plant fats class are unsaturated and are liquid at room temp. Itong plant fats na to class, ito yung madalas na ginagamit natin for cooking, yung mga vegetable oils. Now, pure fat are colorless and they have extremely bland taste. Fats are sparingly soluble in water and, and hence are described as hydrophobic substances. Soluble in organic solvent, then the melting point of fats would depend on the length of the chain of the constituent fatty acid and degree of unsaturation. Geometric isomerism is the presence of double bond in the unsaturated fatty acid of the lipid molecule, producing geometric or cis-trans isomerism. Fats have insulating capacity and they are bad conductors of heat. Emulsification is the process by which a lipid mass is converted to a number of small lipid droplets. The process of emulsification would happen before the fats can be absorbed by the intestine. Fats are hydrolyzed by the enzyme lipase. They yield fatty acids and glycerin. Now, si lipase class, meron niyang partner na amylase. And si amylase naman ang nagde-dissolve sa mga carbohydrates. So, si, si lipase for the fats, si amylase naman for the carbs. Now, the hydrolysis of fats by alkali is called saponification. So saponification class is the hydrolysis of fats. This would result in the formation of glycerol and salt of fatty acids called soap. Hydraulic rancidity is caused by the growth of microorganism which would secrete enzyme like lipases. This would split into fatty, into glycerol and free fatty acids. So here's the classification class of your lipid based on the chemical chemical composition. We have the simple lipids or the homolipids. These are esters of fatty acid with various alcohol. Under that, we have your fats and oils, which are esters of fatty acid with a trihydroxy alcohol. Glycerol naman is a fat that is solid at ordinary room temp and oil is liquid. Then we have your simple triglyceride. These are one in which three fatty acid radicals are similar or the same. Example is tristearin or triolene. And then we have your mixed triglyceride, which are one in which the three fatty acids are different from each other. So kapag simple ang triglyceride class, they have similar, um, similar three fatty acid radicals. Kapag mix, different ang fatty acid radicals nila. Example would be destiaroline, dioleo palmitin. Then waxes are the esters of fatty acid with high molecular weight monohydroxy alcohol. Example would be beeswax and carnauba wax. Then we have your compound lipids or heterolipids. These are esters of fatty acid with alcohol and would possess additional groups. We have your phospholipid or phosph phosphatids. These are compounds containing fatty acid and glycerol in addition to a phosphoric acid, nitrogen bases, and other substituents. They would usually possess one hydrophilic head and two non-polar tail. They are called polar lipids and are amphiphatic in nature. Phospholipids can be phosphoglyceride, phosphoenocytides, and phosphosphingoside. So phosphoglycerides class, these are major phospholipid. They are found in membranes. They are, would contain as they are esterified to hydroxyl groups of glycerol. Example would be lecithin and cephalin. Then phosphoenocytides naman class are said to occur in the phospholipids of the brain tissue and soybean. And phosphosphingocytes naman are commonly found in nerve tissue. Example would be your sphingomyelin. Glycolipids naman class are compounds of fatty acid with carbohydrates and would contain nitrogen but no 
phosphoric acid. Then we have your derived lipids naman class. These are derived from simple and compound lipids by hydrolysis. They would include fatty acid, alcohol, monoglyceride, diglyceride, steroids, terpenes, and carotenoids. The most common derived lipids class are your steroid, terpenes, and carot carotenoids. Steroids do not contain fatty acid. They are non-saponable and are not hydrolyzed on heating. Widely distributed in animal where they are associated with physiological process. Example would be your strain, androstrain. And terpenes naman class are majority found in plants. Example would be natural rubber and gurney. Then carotenoids are tetra terpenes. They are widely distributed in both plant and animal and are exclusively of plant origin. We have also um, essential fatty acids. They cannot be constructed through chemical pathway. Non-essential fatty acids naman are not necessary, to, not necessary to be taken through diet. Unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acid, they have one or more double bond. And saturated fatty acid are long chain of carboxylic acid and does not have double bond. Now, lipids class have no known single common structure and they would commonly occur and the most commonly occurring lipids are your triglyceride and phospholipids. Now, triglycerides are fats and oils and triglycerides have a glycerol backbone bonded to three fatty acids. If the three fatty are similar, then the triglyceride is known as simple triglyceride. If the fatty acids are not similar, then the fatty acids are known as your mixed triglyceride. The second most common class of lipids are your phospholipid. They are found in the membrane of animals and plants. They contain glycerol and fatty acid, and they would also contain phosphoric acid and a low molecular weight alcohol. The most common phospholipid class are your lecithin and your cephalin. So you skip one of Let's go to your proteins class. Now, proteins class are heteropolymers of stings of amino acid. So amino acids are joined together by the peptide bond which is formed between carboxyl group and the amino group of successive amino acid. Proteins are formed from 20 different amino acids depending on the number of amino acids and the sequence of amino acid. So meron silang different function class. So they could be for structural. Example would be muscle fiber. They could be for transport. An example would be your hemoglobin, which would be responsible for transporting oxygen. Movement, contractile fibers in muscles, specifically yung actin and myosin. Immune response would be for the antibodies, complement protein, catalyst such as your enzyme, and monomers of protein such as your amino acid. Now there are four um, levels of protein. You have your primary. A primary class, the thing you need to remember about primary sequence of protein is that they would exist as a long chain of amino acid and they're considered non-functional this is an example of your primary structure and the secondary structure naman class is that the long chain of proteins are folded and they are arranged in a helix shape <coughs> and the structure is called a plated sheet example would be your silk fiber so after that, you have your tertiary structure. These are long peptide bonds that are more stable by folding and coiling. This is done by the formation of ionic or hydrophobic bond or disulfide bridges. And the last one would be your quaternary is when a protein is an assembly of more than one polypeptide or subunits of its own. So to simplify this, ang quaternary nyo, ang quaternary, Quaternary is a combination of multiple tertiary structure. This is what you need to remember. Example would be hemoglobin and insulin. 
the last one, the last topic for today, would be your nucleic acid. So these are organic compounds with heterocyclic rings. Nucleic acids are made of polymer of nucleotides, and nucleotides will consist of a nitrogenous base, a pentosugar, and a phosphate group. A nucleoside is made of nitrogenous base attached to a pentose sugar. The nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil. Polymerase nucleotides would form DNA and RNA, which are genetic material. Nucleic acid natural, are naturally occurring chemical compound that is capable of being broken down to yield phosphoric acid sugar and a mixture of organic bases known as your purines and pyrimidines. Nucleic acid are the main information carrying molecules of the cell, and by directing the process of protein synthesis, they determine the inherited characteristic of every living thing. Now, the two main classes of nucleic acid are your deoxyl ribonucleic acid and ribonuclear acid. So DNA and RNA. So DNA is the master blueprint for life and would constitute the genetic material in all living organisms. Well, yung RNA naman class is more common among viruses but could also be found in all living cells where it is responsible for making proteins. Nucleic acid would hold the genetic code, specifically DNA and RNA, and they would aid in the protein synthesis, specifically RNA. Monomers of nucleic acid are known as your nucleotides. So, the characteristic nila class, they are found in the nucleus and they would catch, it is a catch-all term for DNA and all types of RNA. It's responsible for storing, translating, and passing on its genetic information. Nucleic acid are made up of chains of nucleotide which are composed of a 5-carbon sugar base and a phosphate. Their function would be to store and transfer genetic information, to use genetic information to direct the synthesis of new protein. DNA is the storage for, for the place of genetic information. DNA would also control the synthesis of RNA. And the genetic information is transmitted from DNA to the protein synthesis in the cell. RNA would also direct the production of new protein by transmitting genetic information to the protein building structure. They also have a nitrogenous base which allows, which acts as a backbone that would determine the proteins being synthesized. The function of the double helix of the DNA is that no disorder would occur in the genetic information if it is lost or damaged. RNA naman class would direct synthesis of proteins. Messenger RNA, so sa so RNA class, merong three types. You have your mRNA or your message, messenger RNA, your tRNA or your transcription RNA, and your ribosomal RNA or your rRNA. Si messenger RNA would take genetic message from RNA. Si tRNA would transfer activated amino acid to the cytoprotein synthesis. And si ribosomal RNA are present in the ribosome and is responsible for its stability. So this is the difference between DNA from RNA. So DNA is mostly found in the nucleus, the RNA is a cytoplasm. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic, the RNA would stand for ribonucleic acid. Deoxyribose is the sugar where the bases are A, T, C, and G. Pero kapag RNA naman class, nag-iiba ang sugar bases niya. It becomes A, U, C, and G. So sa DNA class, kasama si thymine. Pero sa RNA, ang kasama, ang kumalit kay thymine is your uracil. DNA is a long polymer. RNA is shorter than DNA. They have a pairing of T, C, and would pair with G. Well, so RNA, A, A would pair with U and C. With U and C would pair with G. So sa DNA, ang magpartner would be adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Kapag naman RNA, ang magpartner class is si adenine at si uracil. 
saka si Guanyin at Saitosin. Si DNA is double-stranded and would exhibit a double helix structure. Single strand, sometimes it would form secondary and tertiary structure. DNA would prefer, prefer a B form and RNA would prefer a A form. Si DNA nyo is more prone to UV damage. RNA is less prone to UV damage. DNA would carry the genetic information necessary for the development of functioning and reproduction. Mainly involved in protein synthesis naman si RNA. So that ends the two lessons for your module.